Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to our first webinar in this webinar series called ChatGPT for Science. Today, we're exploring the critical theme of navigating quality control in ChatGPT, the power of research and citations. I am Julia Heeson, your moderator for today, and I'm thrilled to have you join us for what promises to be a thought-provoking discussion on the interplay between generative AI, research publications, and the pivotal role of citations in ensuring the credibility of large language models. Today's presenters are Chris Vandal, Director of Product Strategy at Research Solutions, and Josh Nicholson, President at Cite. Both bring a wealth of knowledge and insight into the application of citations and quality control and the pursuit of building trust in AI-driven outputs. Um, so before we begin, just a quick housekeeping items for you all. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to share them in the Q&A section. So if you click on Zoom below, hover over that, you'll see Q&A. Um, so you can write your questions in there as soon as they come up, um, and we'll have dedicated live Q&A session with our speakers towards the end of the webinar. And also this webinar is being recorded, and the link will be made available to all of you after the session. So I'll be sending it out an email, so you don't have to worry about that. If you want to share with a colleague, you want to rewatch a specific part, um, we've got you covered. Um, okay, with further ado, I'll turn over the floor to you, Chris. So we're going to have some moderation for a lot of things that Josh will be talking about today. First, a brief introduction to research solutions. We were founded in 2006, uh, originally under the name Reprints Desk. For much of the intervening period, we've been focused on our document delivery service, providing access to all scientific journal content to many of the world's research intensive organizations. In the last couple of years, under the research solutions name, we've been pivoting to address a variety of information needs related to use cases in connection to the innovation process and to research and development. In the development of these software tools, increasingly making use of AI where we're relevant to these tools to provide really the best solutions to those information needs that we can. And in connection to the strategy on the next slide, you'll see that since last summer, we have made two key acquisitions. Site AI, we're going to learn about a lot today. Resolute.ai is a search and discovery platform which is, well, which provides a very sophisticated search experience across a variety of different data sets. So not only scientific journal content, for instance, but also clinical trial information, patent information, competitive intelligence information, et cetera, and so on. But today we are focused on site. As uh, the title of the webinar uh, indicates, we're looking at how we can leverage site and in particular, the unique smart, smart citations, which you're gonna learn a lot about today, and how they can provide a quality control, how they can, they can address issues of trust in generative AI applications such as ChatGPT. During the discussion, terms like large language models and generative AI will be used kind of interchangeably, large language models being the technologies, GPT trained on huge corpuses of text, able to generate amazing text, and really forming the backbone of generative AI applications such as ChatGPT. All right, so on this slide, just sort of setting up for, for what Josh is gonna be talking about. Many of you have used generative AI applications during the last year or so, come to really appreciate the, the efficiencies, the power of these tools to help you in the various tasks that you need to do. But at the same time, also beginning to understanding some of the challenges in terms of transparency and trust that these um, technologies also pose. However, these challenges are not necessarily new uh, to us. Many other sort of related technologies, technologies also related to use cases around search and discovery have faced similar uh, challenges in the past. Um, and with that, we'll start to look at those challenges in the next slides and over to you, Josh. Yeah, so I think we have uh, a poll going. And so maybe we'll give a, a few seconds or, or minutes uh, to let people vote on that. And then I think that will also help it, you know, inform a little bit of the, the following questions. And so can we see those coming in? I can only see the, the poll. 
Yeah, actually, it's going up and down and up and down. So I'll give everyone just another moment here. Exciting to see um, what you all think. And then I'll share their responses with everyone here in just another second. Okay, let's look at this. So the question was, what are the challenges of generative AI as they relate to trust new? And it's about 50-50 almost, yes and no. Um, yeah, and we'll dive a bit more into that in the next slides. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Julia, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I think that's kind of what I was expecting. This is a somewhat nebulous question. Of course, there are new challenges, but there's also challenges that we've long faced with any type of new technology and information. And so I want to talk a little bit today about how citations have been pretty crucial to helping to organize information with new technologies, such as the web, Wikipedia, and, and large language models. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the history and how citations, again, you know, maybe this very niche thing that we don't think about uh, often, ha have really proved to be very pivotal in, in many stages of, of new technologies um, and new ways of, of communicating and, and publishing information. And so flashback to the early 90s, uh, in comes a very you know, powerful technology. We have web browsers, we have new search engines. This is similar to kind of, I would say, you know, the new experience with ChatGPT, right? All these world changing technologies are now starting to emerge. Uh, we're starting to have personal computers. We're starting to be able to interact with massive amounts of information, right? You can look up anything on anything uh, produced by anything. Right. And, and we, you know, look at, at things like Alta Vista, OliWeb, or, or my personal kind of favorite, if I remember as a kid, asking Jeeves. Right. And so these were how we got answers from, you know, these new sources of information, the, the World Wide Web. Um, and of course, there were big challenges here. Right. How do we know what to trust? Is Jeeves going to give us the best article? Is it the most relevant? Is it something that someone made or is it the New York Times? Right. And so there's a variety of different ways. Uh, and this kind of challenge of information overload and organization really, to me, reminds me a, a bit of, of where we are today with large language models like ChatGPT. Uh, and so here is an excerpt from a, a publication that maybe some of you will recognize, and I'll share the title later, that talks a little bit about this challenge, right? And so this is 1998, um, and it's saying, you know, the World Wide Web creates many new challenges for information retrieval. It is very large and heterogeneous. Current estimates are that there are over 150 million web pages with a doubling life of less than one year. More importantly, the web pages are extremely diverse, ranging from what is Joe having for lunch today to journals about information retrieval. In addition to these major challenges, search engines on the web must also contend with inexperienced users and pages engineered to manipulate search engine ranking functions. And so again, this to me you know, has a lot of parallels where we are in the world today with large language models. Right, we're interacting with this new technology, this very powerful technology alongside the web, and we're still trying to figure out what is the best way to do this. Right, the large companies are producing, you know, new ways of interacting uh, with content, as well as new startups, and and as you'll see later, you know, even site. And so, this has not been the only time we've had to kind of contend with new powerful services, technologies, or a way of looking at the information. And so Wikipedia, which I think we can take for granted at this stage, is pretty remarkable, right? This is a crowdsourced encyclopedia by strangers, really, uh, across the world, right, on almost any topic. And yet, in many cases, it's pretty trustworthy. And so how can we trust the fact that we just have people, you know, putting up content, writing sentences uh, on, on the web? How has, how uh, you know, Wikipedia really been able to exist in this way that we can mostly trust it? for the most cases. And, and, and that brings me to kind of this point, which is, you know, how can we trust ChatGPT? Again, ChatGPT is exceedingly powerful, very easy to use. We're using it for many different uh, tasks, whether that's coding, whether that's writing, you know, whether that's just information retrieval, how can we trust this, right? And so how can we trust, you know, these, these web pages from the early days of the web? How can we trust, uh, you know, user-generated encyclopedia? And now how can we trust large language models. Uh, and so that really kind of brings, you know, me to this, this overarching theme is how do we know what to trust and, and what do we look at, you know, as trust markers? Um, and so 
here is, as you can maybe guess at the title and where I'm going with this, citations, I think, play a crucial part, right? And so here is this excerpt from 1998, uh, and this is the PageRank paper. And so maybe some people are familiar with PageRank. This was really you know, written by the founders of Google, and, and I would say what helped organize the web, right? And, and so inspired by you know, citations and academic citations, uh, Sergey Brin and colleagues, you know, looked at that and said, how can we utilize what we're doing in, in research publishing to better inform how we rank uh, the web? And, you know, amazingly, even citation ranking is the title of this paper. And, and so to me, you know, I think that was a big thing that allowed us to go from kind of this massive amount of information web to some semblance of order. Right. And so here on the left is just a, an overview of what, you know, page rank kind of looks like. And you can see, you know, higher ranking um, web pages will, you know, lend more credibility if they cite others. Even very early on, there was a page rank meter. Uh, and, and so, you know, we had this meter to say, is this kind of trustworthy or not? And so this, of course, has become extremely sophisticated and, you know, evolved since then. But really the core thing to highlight is, you know, citations from research papers, you know, were, were ultimately adapted to looking at citations from web pages and starting to kind of look at the quality of that. If you look at Wikipedia, again, there's a crucial kind of theme here of citations, right? And so Wikipedia, you know, you write a, a sentence, you make a claim, again, whether that's on any topic, and if that claim needs to be backed up, there will be this phrase, citation needed, right? And so the way that Wikipedia really kind of works is that we add citations to the claims so that people can fact check them, moderators can fact check them, and we can build some trust here. Right. And so citations, you know, Wikipedia without citations, I would really say is kind of like chat GPT right now. And it would be hard to trust. Right. Because you couldn't verify that you couldn't click through to you know, go deeper on the articles, et cetera. And so, again, I think citations are playing a pretty crucial part, uh, you know, in the early web, also in Wikipedia. And as you may guess from where I'm going, I think they'll play a very crucial part, you know, with large language models. And so. Do we think citations can help with large language models or, or do we think, you know, this is not something, uh, I don't know, do we have a poll here, Julia? Yeah, well, let me pull that up here. Okay, let's see. I feel like I'm leading with this question, but uh, <laughs> we'll see what people say and, and maybe I'll have to work harder to convince. Hey, what's coming in? Thanks to thank you everyone for yeah being so engaging. <laughs> it's really interesting to see what you all think. Okay, it looks like we got them all. That was super quick. Let's share the results. Wow. Yes. So this is overwhelmingly yes. And again, maybe that's because I'm presenting this and kind of leading the witnesses, if you will. But you know, I agree with the the majority of votes here, and I do think citations are crucial. Again, something that, you know, most of us don't think about probably in our day to day, although maybe you do if you're on this this call, uh, I, I do think are going to play a crucial role, you know, with large language models. And so let's look at, you know, various implementations of, you know, these new chat bots here. Um, let me just move zoom a little bit. And so here is Gemini. Uh, I've used this prompt. What are the causes of misinformation? Uh, and if you ask this, you know, on Gemini, what you'll see here is an answer. And, you know, these little uh, icons, if you click them, open up to citations, right? So if you're asking what are the causes of misinformation, it's giving you an answer. The spread of misinformation online and other mediums is a complex issue with multiple contributing factors. That reference is coming from NCBI. So it's coming from a research article. So again, that builds trust that you can say, okay, this seems to be right, or at least there's you know some research behind this. Or, or, you know, there's something that I can at least verify it against. Without that, it looks right. And maybe you don't need that verification. But I think these citations are going to be a crucial part, you know, to look at uh, the, the generative output from large language models. Here is Copilot. Again, same prompt. What are the causes of misinformation? There's different style here. You can see there's this output. But then again, at the bottom, there are citations, right? And so these links or these footnotes look very similar to certain academic papers where you will have footnotes. Maybe this UX is not as good as the other one because you can't see directly which you know, citation relates to what. Uh, but at the same time, it's very early days. 
Uh, and these citations, I think, are just starting to be kind of adapted in this. We'll take a look at another one. And again, here is perplexity. You're asking a question next to each uh, answer is a footnote or a citation. And so to me, the citations paired with these large language models is really how we can start to get to trust. And I think they're going to play a crucial role, especially you know, now, but in the coming years, uh, so that we can actually use these, these tools. And so to me, citations are the new black, and maybe I think that they're the new fashion and so cool because we run a, a company called Cite, but I do think they, they will play you know, a very interesting uh, role going forward. And so I want to talk a little bit about site and about why we started to focus on site, you know, five plus years ago, um, before there were any large language models. Uh, and so I'm going to walk a little bit through the history of site, and then to talk a little bit about what we're doing with large language models. And so this is site as you see it today, but it didn't always look like that. You know, of course, it, it started as an idea. It even started as a paper. And so where did the idea come from and, and what was you know, the challenges that we were starting to look at? Well, in 2012, towards the end of my PhD, uh, a lot of papers started to come out looking at trust in research, right? There was this report that got a lot of attention, which I'm showing here, uh, by two executives at Amgen that said, over the course of 10 years, we tried to validate in-house 53 major cancer studies. Uh, and found out that the majority of the time we could not validate them. And so they called this a reproducibility crisis, right? And so that's a trust crisis. This was similarly reported in Bayer, not just in cancer studies, but across different indications, maybe not as striking and didn't get as much attention because it wasn't nature, but similar types of conclusion. And so the challenges here are like, how do we know to trust in research? There are citations, but is that enough? Can we do more with citations as we see them? And so we wrote uh, a paper back then, and this is actually 2014, so we've been thinking about citations for quite some time, uh, about a potential solution. And that potential solution was to say, hey, what if we use citations to look at the reproducibility of articles, right? Wouldn't it be great if we could see if a citation, you know, was supporting a paper, was challenging a paper, had reproduced a paper or not? And so in my field, I knew, you know, certain studies that, were highly cited, came from you know, the, the world's best universities, were published in the world's best journals, but were irreproducible because amongst you know, uh, that avalanche of citations, there was four groups that ma had maybe retested the claims more stringently and, and couldn't verify them. And so we wanted to start to track this and to be able to say, not, cite not all citations are the same. Wouldn't it be great if you could see you know, more rich information in more context uh, beyond that? And so, in 2018, fast forward four years later, it took us to get here, uh, we built out a prototype, right? And this is the prototype that is really kind of site 0 0.1 or, or whatever version you want to call it, uh, that looks at the text from citing papers and then looks at a very simple classification to say, okay, here is a confirming, we called it confirming back then, or here is a mentioning citation. And so this was the first step towards developing what we call the next generation of citations, to show the context, to show the intent, and then as we evolve to show you know, uh, much more than that. And so I'm gonna walk you through a bit uh, where site is today um, and highlight you know, how that can be helpful to better understand research articles. And then again, how that can be helpful uh, to, to better understand you know, and trust uh, large language models. And so this is uh, my actual research paper uh, when you look at a research paper, again, pre-site, you would naturally just look at where is it published, who are the authors, what are their affiliations, and then some metrics, right? And this is how we would kind of assess a paper. Do I know this journal? Does it have a great reputation? The reputation of eLife is constantly changing year over year now. Uh, is it highly cited? Does it have a lot of views? Has it been shared widely on social media? And we make those decisions just because we have to almost, right? There's too much to keep up with. So we need some kind of proxies of quality to, to say, do we want to read this? Do we want to download this? Do I, you know, how, how is this fit within the community? And so historically, if you click the citations number, it brings you to a citation index like Scopus or Web of Science. These tools will show you a list of citing documents, uh, but they're not going to differentiate why this article cites this article versus this article citing this article, right? And so we're treating citations as if they're flat and more or less as if they're the same, 
uh, with some differences, you know, maybe year or just open access, et cetera, when they're not, right? There's many different ways and reasons to cite an article. There's entire citation ontologies with I think like two dozen or, or, or more different reasons for citing an article, right? And so all that information is there within the full text of the article, but to open 66 different documents to see how and why and where something has been cited is just a massive amount of uh, time, right? And, and potentially cost, right? Because not everything's open. And so we utilize information, I would say very superficially in terms of citation, or we have historically, uh, where a high number is good and a low number is not so good. And so that, you know, I think is why we wanted to focus on citations again, before even knowing what an LLM is, because we think that citations, a core part of trust in research, you know, could be improved. Uh, and so our focus, as I showed you early, you know, stages of, of site and kind of where the genesis of this idea comes from, was to launch a new citation index, right? A smart citation index that allows you to see all this rich information so that you can better understand, better evaluate a research article, a researcher, a journal, or even any topic. And that gets to the fact that research touches everything, right? Not just chromosome missegregation, but there's research on say Peppa Pig, there's research on particle physics, there's research you know, on, on, on really anything you can think about. And it's fun to try and search uh, something where you think there's not research. And undoubtedly there's a research paper and someone that spent half a decade probably uh, studying it, right? And, and that to me is amazing because behind research uh, is, you know, experiments, there's evidence, there's analyses, there's statistics. That's how we can inform new ideas, new technologies, new social progress, and things like that. And so research is exceedingly crucial, but there's challenges of keeping up with it, knowing what to trust, and knowing what to build on top of. Um, and so, you know, Google has a saying, standards uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and I think that's, you know, very true here. Uh, with with research, right? If you build uh, your your work on something that's irreproducible, that might directly impact your own. And so, zooming in a bit, what does this look like? Like, what is a next generation citation or a smart citation? Well, quite simply, it's very similar to a traditional citation in that it is showing a list of citing articles. But then, different to that, what we're doing is extracting out the citation context and the citation statement. And so, you can very easily see why this article is citing it, right? And so here it says, in agreement with previous work, and then cites Nicholson et al., the trisomic clones showed similar aberrations, albeit to a lesser extent. This excerpt comes from the results section of uh, uh, this article, and then has been classified by a deep learning model as presenting supporting evidence. And so we're no longer showing the R factor and you know having trying to boil it down to this individual article, but we're showing you how, why, and where something has been cited, and if there's any supporting evidence or contrasting you know, evidence or analyses to the claim. So helping you really kind of understand things in a more digestible way. Of course, all this information is there, and maybe you should read every single full text article, but I can tell you that's not happening. And you know, to read 80 articles to see what they've said about one uh, is, is just you know, totally impractical that, that we can't do that. And so to get here, again, uh, it's not something that you just snap your fingers uh, uh, overnight. Uh, so we wrote the idea in 2014. We started working on it in 2018. In fact, in 2014, we wrote that someone else should do this because we didn't even think we could do it. Uh, in 2018, uh, we started to really full-time work on this. And so we built out that prototype. Uh, we started with open access content just to look at that prototype. And then increasingly, we started to talk with publishers. Right? And so the world's research is not entirely open. You can't just download all of it and analyze it. You need to interact and cooperate with publishers. And so this graph is a year out of date. And I'm getting yelled at now because it's a year out of date and I need to refresh it. Uh, but we'll show you kind of the trajectory. And that trajectory uh, is that we have spent a significant amount of time and energy forming trusted partnerships with publishers to gain access to the full text of scholarly articles so that we can extract out these citation statements and make it available via site to researchers, to students, to industry professionals, to journalists, to famous book authors, to anyone that might be interested in research. And so this is a challenge, and this is you know, a challenge for us that we're still working on. We've signed two new indexing agreements that we'll be announcing soon with research solutions, and hopefully more to come. Because again, 
you need access to the research in order to organize uh, or classify the research. The second challenge that we face, and I, I think the timing of what we've done is, has been helpful here, is a technical one. And so first getting legal license to look at the full text of subscription-based articles in addition to open access articles is the first step. The second step is once you get access to articles, you need to be able to process them. And that might seem easy uh, because a lot of articles are formatted in XML today, but most are not, right? Especially if you go pre-2000, most are still formatted as PDFs. And so here is a visual representation of what this looks like for us to process. We get PDFs that have two columns, they have three columns, they have one column. There are literally thousands of different reference styles, which is a pain for researchers to format it, but is it also a pain for machines to extract out this information. And so we utilize an open source tool called Grobid, which has been 10 years in the making by this amazing researcher, Patrice, uh, in the countryside of France. We utilize that and we've you know, contributed back open source and, and utilize other things to process millions of different PDFs. Uh, and so here, you know, we have to identify that this is a citation in the paper, not some math or not some you know, gene name or something else. We have to identify as a citation, match Tang et al, for example, to the correct tang at all in the reference, and maybe there's multiple tang at alls, take that string of information, which is again varying uh, by reference style. Some will have abbreviated journals, some will have full names, some will have DUIs, and then take that string of information and match that against metadata from Crossref or data site. That in itself is extremely challenging, right? And so there's this big technical challenge. In addition to that, we take the text you know, with this citation sentence and then have a deep learning model that looks to classify the citation statement as, does this present supporting evidence? Does it present contrasting evidence to the cited claim? And so we developed that deep learning model uh, by manually reading 40,000 different citation statements from a variety of different disciplines. Uh, and so early on, you know, when you had that prototype, you can still remember sitting in coffee shops just spending hours looking at these different statements. We built even this, what we call video game, where it would show different ones and you could classify it. We then did it you know, from a mobile app and I could be in the gym saying, okay, this looks like supporting, contrasting. Um, and that was challenging, right? That's time consuming. You'd have to have at least two different experts, sometimes 10 different experts agree on this to build out this training data set. And so that took years to do and maybe is a lot easier now with large language models, but was crucial to get right. And the one thing worth emphasizing here is that this is not just positive or negative sentiment. It's not enough to say, I don't like this study. It's really trying to look at, is there supporting evidence analyses or contrasting evidence or analyses to the claim? So we don't wanna collect just you know, negative opinions on the research. We really wanna look at you know, the evidence here, uh, which is a higher bar. And so uh, again, Given this theme of trust, uh, we, we wrote a paper on this uh, describing in detail uh, how we built site. And, and it's funny to kind of look back at this because our numbers are, you know, back then were 880 million classified citation statements, which I remember at 200 million and 500 million, it kept climbing this. And now we're at, you know, I think 1.2 billion or maybe 1.3 billion citation statements, uh, which is the world's largest collection of, of citation statements. And so this will give you a lot more detail on the pipeline, the precision, the deep learning models, the challenges, what other people have done historically as well. Uh, and this is open access, so you can go read that uh, uh, when you're interested. As part of you know, creating the next generation of citations, it's not enough to just be an island to yourself. You really need to work with publishers to display this information on the version of record. And so we are now live on millions of different articles uh, across uh, many different publishers, and there's a variety of different styles. Here's how Wiley shows this, and this is pretty early on, so it's only showing types, not even the documents. Uh, but this is live on 120 plus journals on Wiley. It's live on every article from the Royal Society, and here you can see it broken down by different types with the documents here. Some publishers will show citations by sections. Walters Kluwer, for example, shows citations not by if they're supporting or contrasting citations, but if there's uh, citation and introduction section or the method section, et cetera. Um, here is the American Physiological Society. Again, a slight variation in the design, but a lot more nuanced than what has historically been shown, just this flat list. And I would say a lot more engaging. I would also say that this is going to evolve in itself, right? This is nice, but we think we could even do better. 
and display some native citation statements on the version of record. So instead of just having recommended articles, you can see citation statements directly in line on the publisher page. And that's what we're working to do with a variety of different publishers now, which I think, again, will be a very powerful way of reading an article, building out that trust, so that we can utilize all this extremely you know, powerful information in a better way. Here it is on PNES, they've chosen this design. Um, and again, you know, that's influencing you know, research here on gender inequities in online dissemination of scholar work. And so this touches everything, right? And, and that's a pretty powerful way of organizing and improving how citations uh, you know, can, can help uh, information. And so with that, you know, what about ChatGPT? Well, I've shown some instances where ChatGPT, you know, is being, uh, uh, you know, basically large language models are having citations. But if you utilize ChatGPT, you know, at the basic level, it, it's, it's still missing that, right? And so here is a tweet from a researcher asking ChatGPT to give them a bibliography, uh, looking at publication bias and clinical trials. They, the ChatGPT produces some, uh, a, a list these lists have real journals. JAMA is a real journal. It has a DOI, DOI that looks real. Uh, these authors are probably real in some cases, but if you look at this as a whole, these are not articles that actually exist. You can't go read them, right? And so we are seeing students increasingly request articles that don't exist from librarians. And consequently, that means that people are utilizing information that has been hallucinated or is just untrustworthy. And in our space of research, utilizing this information can be paramount uh, to have you know, trust, right? This could impact social policy, it could impact clinical decisions. And so we need, if we're going to use large language models, a better way to, to trust them. And so coming back to this, we think LLMs need citations, just like Wikipedia needed citations, just like the early web needed a better form of citations. We think that is going to be crucial here with large language models. And so we found ourselves in a pretty unique area, you know, spending five years partnering with publishers, building out next generation citations uh, to apply them to, to uh, what we call Site Assistant. Site Assistant is trying to marry the best in, uh, of, of large language models, the flexibility, the ease of use with the trust of peer reviewed articles and next generation citations. And so you can ask a question like how many rats live in NYC and get answers directly from research articles. And you can see how those articles have been cited themselves, right? So it's not enough to just say, here's an article. We're going even deeper than that, allowing you to see how that's been cited. And so this is what this looks like. You know, what's the relationship between sunlight exposure and serotonin levels? It gives you this response. It then gives you these references and you can look over and see, here's what the generative output was. And here is what the research article says. Right? And so we're doing as much as we can to eliminate this uh, automatically and technically from our side. We're also making it you know, very easy for you to try to see and say, okay, can I trust this from a UX perspective? Can I read this sentence? And can I compare that quickly to the citation statement and say, okay, that seems trustworthy. And I think that is our kind of North Star with Assistant is to build out control and trust so that you can better ask a question and better utilize the world's knowledge uh, for all different use cases. Again, whether you're a student, whether you're an industry professional, or whether you just have a question uh, you know, about something that, that relates to your personal life. Um, and so I would be remiss if I you know, didn't acknowledge Eugene Garfield here. And so Eugene Garfield you know, created the world's first science citation index, uh, which became Web of Science, um, which influenced uh, you know, directly Google. Uh, I believe he's even cited in that page rank paper. Uh, I would like to acknowledge him. I would also like to highlight, you know, that he saw a lot of this coming, right? And so back in 1964, he published a paper uh, that asked, can citation indexing be automated? And that paper is highly worth reading, so I'd encourage you to go read it. But I'm just going to share an excerpt here. And that excerpt relates exactly to kind of what we're doing with Cite, but I would also say even with large language models. And so from this excerpt, he describes basically adding a useful additional marker to traditional citation indices. And he says these markers would appear in the published citation index along with the usual citation data. In the case of the paragraph above, for example, critique or one of several other terse statements like Mr. X is wrong, data spurious, conclusions wrong, calamity for mankind might be appropriate. He even says, and again, this is 1964, the intelligent machine 
would examine a new document and generate a critical statement such as rather poor paper. And so in many ways, we're kind of building out what Eugene Garfield talked about <laughs> decades ago uh, in this paper, uh, but it's just been the timing of us doing it, right? The deep learning models to classify citation statements didn't exist in the 1964s. You couldn't have technically done this. There wasn't enough open access to prove out this concept and then large language models to utilize this new way again, weren't there when Eugene Garfield there, which highlights and underscores, I think, the importance of timing uh, on this. Uh, but it also you know, undercuts this thread of people have been thinking about citations for a long time and how can we improve them in a variety of different you know, new technologies, systems, uh, and then also ways of, of working. And so we have hopefully a lot of questions. I can see eight chats and four Q and A's and, and we have a good amount of time left. So I'm going to stop there uh, and, and, you know, see, you know, what, what you all think. Uh, happy to have feedback and happy to answer anything uh, that you might uh, say. Awesome. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, before we jump into the Q&A, uh, just two short messages. One is uh, next week, our colleague Dom will be diving into, you know, some of those technical challenges that Josh mentioned really looking behind the scenes, scenes at Site Assistant and, and the technical and the way it's been, been built um, to, to provide the service that, that we've just shown. And also if you're interested in uh, a free trial to this, so as students and individuals, you can sign up for, for a free trial. And if you belong to an organization which you would like to trial this for your organization, you can um, go to this link here. All right. so. Let's jump into the Q&A, and there's a bunch of questions here already. Uh, a couple of different topics. Um, so first of all, first question was um, actually related back to ChatGPT, um, and in particular calling out 3.5, or we have four now as well. Uh, the point that ChatGPT and some other language models tend to make up citations, so invent them, so hallucinations, et cetera. Do, yeah, do you see this generally improving in the next years? Yeah, so I, I think there's you know massive amounts of competition uh, in this space right now with very big players, right? Microsoft, Google, there's new startups. Um, I think ultimately they're all trying to figure out what is the best way to look at this, right? What is the best way people can use this? I do think most of them are already adopting citations and trying to eliminate hallucinations as much as possible. And so I do think like, you know, from a product perspective, there will need to be implementations of limiting, you know, hallucinations. And so I, I don't know if it's just chat GPT 3.5 gets better on its own, but I think through the product development uh, and the use of any large language model, I think they have to improve, right? And, and I think the things that people care about is trust, right? The technology is going to not stick around for a long time if people can't use it in a trustworthy way. Um, and so the things that I think are being addressed are trust. I also think there's, you know, legal challenges as well, right? There's these new technologies that analyzes the entire World Wide Web. Um, and so there's some legal ambiguity there uh, amongst different groups. And that's still being worked out across, uh, you know, different tools and service providers as well. But ultimately, we're so very early on. ChatGPT has not been around that long. Uh, we're seeing massive amounts of improvement. And I think that is going to continue, you know, whether that's 3.5, 4, you know, new models from competitors. And, and I think that competition is really driving a lot of this. Um, so, yes. All right. There's a few other questions related to ChatGPT specifically and also to Cobalt. We'll, we'll address those first. Um, first of all, behind Site Assistant, uh, which large language model is being used? That is indeed ChatGPT, which version? I forget. It's so we can so we are agnostic and so we are using gpt 3.5 16k turbo um we can use any model though so we have used other large language models in the past for larger organizations we can use whatever large language model they want um, and so there's again a huge arms race between these large language model providers trying to say we're the best and we're the best because of x y and z um, and we can plug in those different ones. Right now at the standard, it is 3.5, 16K, um, but it's it's pretty agnostic. And Dom will talk a little bit about this uh, next week. Mm -hmm. 
And kind of related to that, there's some sort of integration type questions. So in that case, using site in conjunction with Copilot, depending on, on, on the use case, I guess, is possible? I, I, so technically it's possible, right? And I, I think mm -hmm. there's a variety of different ways. You can copy Copilot stuff in there. Uh, we have not built a plugin that works and then Copilot. This also talks a little bit about the next one. Uh, yeah. And I think that relates to a variety of different things. A, what are we allowed to legally do with our, our content from publishers, right? And so we have, you know, trusted partnerships with publishers uh, and we have to consider those. The second is, you know, what does this mean, right? Like, does that mean we just build out something that's used into ChatGPT? Can we control what is being developed in there? You know, there, there's all these kinds of questions. And so we consider this. But, you know, currently on the roadmap, there is not a plugin uh, that, that we're intending to build for, for ChatGPT. We are using that, you know, in the back end to develop Site Assistant, where we can really look at a lot more of these things around control and where we can display, you know, the citation context, right? We are not allowed to display the citation context on other uh, servers or other or platforms. And so that's, you know, one reason why we do that. And I think it's not enough to just say, here's a sentence, here's the reference, right? Because again, you need to quickly say, is that actually what the reference says? And so we think about this a lot from the UX perspective to make it easy to see that so that you can validate it, you know, from a, a machine learning level, but also from a user level and quickly understand that. Um, and maybe that exposes some weaknesses because sometimes you can see when it's wrong, but at least you can see that. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, why we haven't developed a plugin uh, and, and don't really have a plan to. All right, there's a couple of questions which are starting to sort of related to sort of sources of content that can be used um, with the site assistant. There's a question related to the uploading of articles in a PDF format to inquire with site AI. Yeah, so you can do that. I would say it's not a perfect implementation right now because if you upload an article, it's not asking the full text of the article. We're processing that article and extracting out citation statements. And so if you upload a PDF that doesn't have any citations, it's not going to analyze it at all. And so there are other tools. Adobe just announced you know, this ability to chat with PDFs. We think a lot of these other services, in many cases, are stronger than, than site there. Uh, and so that's something we think about, but we also are pretty cognizant around like, what does that mean? What does that mean around copyright? How can we store this? You know, and, and things like that. And are there better groups to look at that? And, and so it is certainly possible on site. I wouldn't say it's the best implementation of it. And I do think there are other groups, but it's something that we'll consider and continue to work on uh, uh, as well. And so we certainly love the, the feedback on that. Yeah. You just mentioned a keyword just then, which is which is copyright. Uh, and there was a question here about um, the range of agreements or range of publishers that that we have agreements with. Uh, that specifically, the question is, is OA content of publishers with which you do not have an agreement incorporated into site AI, um, assuming then that the non-OA content is not? Yes. So yes, we, we again started purely on PLOS. And PLOS is OA, you could download it at a zip and you could analyze it very easily. And so, you know, well, OA uh, has been talked about for decades. I think the declaration on OA is 20 plus years old at this point. And that was not just for humans to read, but also for machines. And that was a big part of this, recognizing that we are having this, you know, explosion in, in literature and it, we're going to need the assistance of machines to look at this. Um, and so we do certainly rely upon uh, open access papers. We also rely upon open uh, references. And so references, just a list of references, have not always been open um, until a couple of years. And so thanks to the community of researchers, publishers, everyone involved, there's this initiative for open citations, which said, hey, we think citations should be open because they're crucial in understanding these things. That went from, I think, like 25% of, of publishers made their references open to 100%. And so we have every Elsevier reference, despite not having every Elsevier full text. And I think that is, again, lucky, right? Like we didn't, we were part of that, you know, we encouraged this, but this was a community effort really to make these uh, references open. And right now there's, you know, community effort to make abstracts open. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, there's, there's this tension. We want to have trust. We want to have control as publishers. And that makes sense. We also need to be able to utilize this in, in different, you know, ways. Um, and so, yeah. Well, so that was, there's a couple of questions where you're sort of looking at some of the data sources for, for site and site assistant at the moment. 
There's an interesting question here, which refers to potential other sources of information. So specifically, it was around, you know, looking at, you know, UN related policy documents, uh, or other sources of information, how, you know, could that be incorporated at some stage? Yeah, so so that's a great question. So historically, we have, you know, looked at research articles. Research articles can mean a lot of different things. And so we're looking at book chapters, we're looking at preprints, clinical trials, systematic reviews, data sets even. Uh, and so we're looking at a variety of different content. But with that said, it needs to have been assigned a digital object identifier from Crossref or data site. And that is roughly, I think, 190 million different document types. There are other types of documents that are very valuable, right? These could be government reports, these could be UN reports, these could be patents, these could be financial filings. And so we would like to include that. And that is, you know, part of the piece of the puzzle of not having Resolute and Cite so separate from each other, but bringing the best of the both worlds together. And so ultimately, yes, we will include external data sets. Uh, we will still have a high bar to make sure they're trusted data sets. Because again, we don't want to just index and look at the entire web. We want to really stay focused on research and research related types of content. Uh, but, but that's certainly in the roadmap uh, of, of including different types of content um, and can include gray literature from you know, policy places and as well as governmental organization stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the last... This is a good okay. one, yeah. Yeah, so this one here, yeah, it's about the source of citations, actually, which is being provided or visualized by, by site, um, especially when the source of a citation or a comment might actually be, you know, a paper which the paper is extracted from is actually citing. Yeah, so, so this is a, a good observation, and I think Dom talks specifically to this. And so basically, the question kind of gets at it, if you ask a question, it's looking at citation statements. Well, citation statements refer to another paper. And so sometimes the answer is pointing to another paper, right? And, and you know, from the user perspective, you can just click that paper and see it. And so if you actually go to site.ai slash assistant uh, and run the how many rats live in NYC question, it gives you a, a response and it says between two to eight million. It then gives you a citation statement from a paper that refers to another paper. And so we want to show you both really, we would ideally show you the original source paper directly as the reference. And so we do work on that, but there is technical challenges to that. And so again, this is you know something that Dom was going to present in the next webinar, uh, we'll, we'll talk to, and, and we call this, I, I think it's like secondary citations or citation chaining. Uh, but, but it's also in, in some ways a good thing to see like kind of both. Um, and you can certainly still click to that original paper, even if it's not using the direct one there. There are actually two questions in regards to predatory journals. One is, yeah, would will we find predatory journal and article and, and journals in uh, in the database that site AI is is referencing? Um, and plus, the other question related to that was, does site metrics then provide a tool for detecting predator journals? Yes. So those are good questions. Um, so we're trying to give you the best references, right? But best is a subjective term, right? That can mean a lot of different things. And so the way that we rank articles that we search on is based on relevancy, based on recency, based on citations, supporting citations, contrasting citations, and then deranked on predatory journals, right? And so there was an early user, maybe, I don't know, five months ago that said, hey, this is great, but it gave me this journal. And this is a predatory article. And so we do take that into consideration and it shouldn't show. Of course, you know, there, this is not as straightforward as one may think, right? There could be a good article in a predatory journal that answers this. And so it's not as black and white uh, as, as saying this is predatory or not. And there could be huge debates over what is predatory, right? Uh, and, and so we are considering it and we do, you know, take that into account and we do minimize and I would say minimize. Nothing is going to be perfect in any solution as much as possible, so that's not included. Um, what was the second part of that question? Um, yeah, yeah, you know, utilizing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I the second. So can we utilize this information to identify like predatory journals? So mm -hmm. yes and no, right? Like we work with uh, Cabell's, which you know is looking at journal rankings. 
they utilize a variety of different things to say like this is a trustworthy journal it's not a trustworthy journal site is part of that that toolbox that they're utilizing and so i do think citation types and rich citations can help you know looking at journals right and we've even done a comparison of you know sites uh, by a site index versus a journal impact factor to see does that change how we view journals and so we don't do too much around journals and ranking because i think you know it can be somewhat confusing and, and there's a lot of you know baggage if you will there uh, but i do think there is a, a a role for us to play here um, and i think most of that is again really kind of around trust site is not great at detecting fraud right like there can be a fraudulent paper that has a supporting citation but what i think is important about that is it allows you to kind of follow these traces and say okay here's a paper that was maybe retracted for fraud and here's other ones that purport to uh, support it, right? Maybe those need to also be looked at, right? And so we're still very early on. And, and I think where this is going to start to get interesting is as bibliometricians and researchers use our data to start to answer these questions more deeply. And so if you are a, a researcher and bibliometrician, we do share our data for bibliometrics so you can better start to analyze and say, are there gender differences between, you know, supporting and contrasting citations? What about retracted studies? You know, how does that look at the different types of citations, the sections of citations? And so all the different bibliometric studies we're doing, we can now add a new layer because we have, you know, richer citations looking at this. Okay, just a couple more questions by the looks. One is about, um, well, there's two questions about some functionality we'll come to in a moment. But first of all, what to what extent does Cite is also looking at non-English language Content. Yeah, so so this is a good question and, and kind of observation, right? The the world's research doesn't just happen in English. Uh, and so most content insight is English based, right? And, and that's historically how a lot of the world has written it, at least if you look at historically in the last couple of decades. Uh, with that said, it's not all, right? And, and we actively want to partner with and include non-English content. And so we have specifically ingested hundreds of thousands of articles in Turkish, uh, you know, articles in French and German and Chinese. Uh, and we're increasingly discussing with partners in different geographies how we can have this global view. And so while most is still in English, I think 95%, so the vast majority, there is non-English based content in research or in, in research and in sight. Uh, and, and we consider that to be valuable, right? Because there are different voices and different research from say the global South, if you will, that is extremely valuable that might not be included in traditional citation indices. So having this comprehensive and inclusive, you know, record of research uh, is important, um, but it's challenging, of course, right? There's technical challenges to this. Um, and then there's challenges of forming relationships in different geographies with different governments and different, you know, publishers around the world. But it, it, it's a big aim of ours. Uh, and, and I would love to see, you know, more of that happen on our end because I think it's, it's really powerful uh, to to include the world's research, not just the world's English-based research. So the last, yeah, the last two questions looks like a bit more around functionality. So how can we make use of the dashboard on site? Yeah, so a dashboard, which I didn't cover here, uh, effectively allows you to run a search on site and to say, I want to search on chromosome segregation. I find 5,000 articles. I want to group them. Right, so you can create dashboards as groups of articles. You could also call them libraries. I think we had a challenge discovering if we wanted to call it a library or a dashboard, but they're just groups of different articles. And so you can do that from our search. You could also say you've run a search or a systematic review or something in another search tool. You can bring that list of articles into site to create a dashboard. And so that's useful for better understanding areas of interest that is not a journal, but is maybe based on a topic or a drug or a disease or a technology. Um, to see, you know, what is the trend of debate looking like over time? Are there any retractions? What does this look like in terms of the citations? Who's publishing in that area? And then what is that table of articles? And so those dashboards are useful for grouping articles based on your interest. And then from there, there's a lot of different things. You can set up email alerts. You can also ask a question based of your dashboard articles. So maybe you want to use Assistant as it relates just to a specific topic. And you can ask it that, but you can also restrict it to whatever your dashboard has. And so that's certainly one use case there as well. Yeah, and the last question was around actually using Site Assistant. 
for generating content. So doing write-ups, doing summaries of literature, um, and yeah, potential useful prompts to support those types of use cases. Yeah, so how you prompt or how you ask something will really change kind of the use here, right? And, and even if you run the same prompt, you can still sometimes get different, you know, uh, responses. And that's just kind of the nature of generative AI. Uh, and so we would encourage you to like test it out, explore different settings. There's very powerful settings on site uh, and to try different prompts, right? And, and we ourselves are trying to make it as easy as possible to just, you know, put in a prompt. But, but it ultimately, again, like this will come to the user that is like, well, what is the best way to do this? Um, and so it is very useful for getting started on writing. And, and that can be a blog post. It can be a literature review. It can be an internal review that you send to an email. But I think you need to go beyond that, you know, and then fill in gaps, write some more. And so it's not intended to replace the full writing of an article. But I think it's a great starting point to have a conversation with research, really, and to also start to do drafts. Uh, for a variety of different use cases uh, that can really help with writing. And and again, sometimes it's fun to try and get creative or, or break, and you can ask it to write, you know, a poem about chromosome missegregation or a rap about chromosome missegregation with references, right? And so the creativity is kind of the limit here. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes I play around and try and get like really creative answers um, but, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, an endless kind of limits and we are going to, I'd say, uh, produce like various prompts to help people guide for these different things. So that's a good question. And also kind of a good idea where we can help with some training material, uh, which is what we're working on now. Awesome. All right. So that brings us to the end of our questions. We're also almost out of time. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure providing this webinar to everyone who has attended. Uh, Josh or Julia, do you have any last comments before we finish up? Um, no. I'm sorry, Josh, you first. I would say no. I would just say thank you to everyone for the questions. Uh, I, I love all these questions and it does help you know, improve the feedback. And so beyond just setting up demos or trials, if you have things that are not working for you or that you wanna see, uh, let us know, um, and and we we really do listen to that feedback. We do a lot of user interviews, uh, and we're constantly thinking about like how can we how can we make this useful for you, right? And how can we make you know research useful? So so thanks for for joining. I know we're all drowning in in webinars and zooms. Yes. Uh, also from me, thank you everyone for joining. I'm just adding one more link here. Uh, so if you do have any additional questions or you want to play around with it, ask for that free trial. Um, you can head over there. Um, it's in the chat right now. And um, yeah, I hope to see you on the next webinar with Dom on Tuesday. Thanks everyone.